start into the maneuver and the nose starts coming up. I'm like, nah, this isn't good. And if I pulled any more, it was going to snap. So I can't, I can't unload. I can't like, well, so the plan had been the hammerhead. So I pushed the, the rudder into hammerhead and apparently it was just slightly forward and neutral of thick. So it inverted snap for about half a turn. <laughs> Fuck. So I got the rudder out, got it kind of pointed downhill like this, and then bring the stick back to neutral, then it tries to snap positive G. <laughs> God damn it, the fucking engine's off. And I'm like, I know Colby can see this. <laughs> so this is the high speed, high G, and aerobatic flight demonstration for the Jelly Bean Thorpe, the last flight of the program, and by far the most exciting. So this flight was the, the last flight of the uh, Jelly Bean Thorpe program. The purpose of this flight was uh, first to expand uh, the dive envelope of the airplane out to VNE or 210 miles an hour, expand out to the uh, G limit for the airplane, which at this weight was uh, 5.4 uh, uh, or 5.3 Gs, and three to clear the aerobatic envelope for the airplane. The first two uh, were taken care of with large dives. So uh, we did a build up approach with stick wraps on five knot centers out to 210 miles an hour and then wind up turns uh, progressing in G over multiple pulls out to that 5.5 G target. And then the aerobatic portion was about confirming the minimum safe speed to enter uh, the common aerobatic maneuvers, those being rolls and loops. Uh, we've taken some flack on the internet for not wearing a parachute for the bulk of the jelly bean program. Um, and I, you know, I wouldn't say that I'm proud that I didn't use a parachute for it. It's important to note that this airplane had previously had its 40 hours flown off. They were just flown off back in the, uh, sixties. Uh, so therefore there, there wasn't good, um, notes as to where the airplane had been. Uh, so that combined with the fact that we were redoing the phase one meant that we should re-clear the entire envelope. But, uh, I decided it was relatively low, low risk and flew without a parachute. I did fly with a parachute and a helmet on this flight because obviously, uh, you know, the risk of a structural failure when you're taking the airplane to limit load um, is significant. And so having a parachute uh, gave me the confidence to, to fly that card. We've covered it in other videos, but it's worth saying again that uh, stick wraps are an incredibly dangerous way to clear a flutter envelope. Uh, it's unlikely with a stick wrap that you'll be able to excite the high frequency vibration uh, that uh, is that most likely your flutter will occur at. It's also unlikely that you will uh, be able to uh, detect the onset of flutter at the speed, you know, five knots before the speed that it happens, uh, before explosive flutter destroys the airplane. However, uh, it does do a better job than just simply touching the airspeed and backing back out without doing anything uh, to clear the envelope. And uh, I believe that uh, with the proper uh, technique, uh, uh, one can increase the chances so you can do better than the average. You'll notice that uh, as I work my way through the speeds, uh, the stick wraps, uh, the time spent at each speed goes up and the, um, and the, uh, the likelihood that I will repeat a wrap goes up. In the Thorpe, the... Uh, 
axis of concern is the pitch axis. Uh, there were, there's been several cases of uh, uh, horizontal flutter on Thorpes. There's a fantastic article in uh, Sport Aviation uh, back in the 80s by John Thorpe about flutter and how to do stick wraps uh, because of those accidents. So uh, you'll notice that as the speed increases, I'm spending more and more time being very deliberate in the pitch axis and trying to study what's going on. The axis did get more lively uh, as I approached VNE, uh, there was a couple times where I considered knocking it off, repeated the point, and decided it was safe to continue. Uh, but this is uh, this is the risk associated with flutter testing, and I do believe that uh, it's valuable to the end user of the airplane to know that the airplane's been to VNE, and I believe that stick wraps do a better job of clearing that speed, that VNE speed, than doing nothing when you get there. So again, my responsibility for a flight test program of a you know phase one flight test program of a home-built airplane is to uh, clear an envelope that the end user will be able to safely operate the airplane in. So uh, uh, clearing the speed and G envelope of the airplane, uh, in this case, uh, clearing minimum aerobatic speeds for the airplane are all about establishing an envelope within an owner uh, can focus on whatever the rest of the tasks are that are flying, right? So it's better to have a structural failure of the airplane with a parachute on well above a bailout altitude on a clear VFR day over an airport than to have it uh, in the clouds with your right wife in the right seat after flying, you know, eight hours cross country, uh, you know, to, to go see grandma for Thanksgiving. And that's the service that we provide here. So the wind-up turns, a uh, couple things that I like to do. Number one, I don't like to do the entire wind-up from, uh, you know, typically you're sitting for the most of the program right around 2 Gs to go to all the way from 2 Gs to max G, so in this case 5.4 Gs. I don't like to do that in one pull. I like to try to break that up into maybe uh, one and a half G increments, something like that. The goal being to give yourself the maximum amount of time uh, to perceive that there's a structural failure happening or getting ready to happen uh, before you uh, proceed to the full G. Uh, the, the biggest thing on this, and we've talked about it in other videos, is you want to try to maximize the height of the nose uh, when the maximum G is applied. The idea being to therefore maximize the... Uh, the uh, trajectory of the scatter pattern. So for instance, if you were diving the airplane straight down and pulled the G there, you'd already be going 150 miles an hour point, you know, point straight down when the airplane came apart. Uh, that would minimize the amount of time you had to get out of the airplane, get away from the debris, and deploy your parachute. Uh, vice versa, if you could take that 150 miles an hour and pull, say, at two Gs, because you don't want to expand the envelope there, get the nose pointed uphill, and then do your pull, uh, you would have the time it takes to decelerate and then re-accelerate uh, with the debris uh, as you head back to, down towards the ground. Uh, all that added time uh, to get your parachute out. Uh, currently uh, about a mile west of the airport showing uh, 8,500. Okay, clear to 3.5 Gs. Okay. 
Uh, so we've uh, got to four G's, but uh, with the nose nose pointed up, I'm getting to stall Buffett before I can go more than that. So I'm going to have to do a level pull. We'll try that to get to five. If that doesn't work, we'll have to do it in a descent. Okay, here it comes with a level pull. Diving through 180. All right, just shy of red line now. We're level. Here comes the G. Clear to five Gs. I uh, went online to the uh, Thorpe online community, which is actually a very strong community, and looked at their suggested uh, entry speeds for those standard maneuvers, loops and rolls. Uh, and then the goal for this flight was to go out and demonstrate them. Build up to a roll is pretty straightforward. Once you've established the airplane has enough roll rate or enough roll power at a given speed, you're just uh, just marching your way through the rolls as you work from a, a higher speed down to a lower speed. And since the uh, the suggested speed, which I believe was 180 miles an hour, was so fast relative to what I would consider a min safe speed for the airplane, I was able to I was able to march that down pretty quickly. Here comes the acro. Rolls with 180 as entry. Rolls with 170 as entry. Rolls with 160 as entry. Rolls with 150 as entry. Rolls with 140 as entry. Rolls with 130 as entry. Rolls with 120 as entry. Rolls with 110. I think 100 is going to be plenty. We'll do that one now. Yeah, 100's a little slow. We'll call it 110. Took the same uh, tactic with the loop, uh, but first, before I started doing loops in the airplane, since I'd never looped the airplane before, I started with just very deep uh, wing overs. So start with relatively shallow wing overs, then relatively deep wing overs, and then we start committing to the actual loop. Okay, so here comes the build up for the loop. I'm gonna start with uh, wing overs, and we're gonna start at 180 for the entry speed. Level XL at 9,500, showing three miles west of the field. Okay, here comes the first wing. Alright, 
over the top at 80. Here comes my down line. 160 at the bottom. Reset for another one. Next one will be at a 170 entry. Okay, loop 170, here it comes. Showing 8,500, two miles west of the field. The big thing with this maneuver is since we've, we do a loop and then we do it slower and slower and slower, uh, the point at which you realize that you're at the minimum speed for the loop is the point at which the airplane stalls, probably on the top or near the top of the loop. And so that's fine if the airplane's on the back side of the loop or, or right at the top of the loop, because even if you go to zero G, the airplane will just fall through. The problem is if you get it uh, on that up line as you're still going up, because the airplane has a, has a no negative G limit because the flaps are, have no up lock, because you can't force the nose down, you can find yourself, as we did, with the nose stuck going straight up, right? Unable to unload. So you can unload to zero, but you can't unload to uh, negative G. So even at zero, you can't get quite enough pitch rate, and therefore the airplane's still bleeding speed very quickly. And the plan had been, uh, in that event, to use a, uh, a hammerhead recovery. Okay, there's 160. 3G pull. 80 over the top. Since I started with the rolls and the speeds online were very conservative, I went into the loops with a, a lot of confidence that there was a lot of margin in the loop entry speed like there was in the roll entry speed. And that's what set up uh, this last scenario. 
And that lesson is uh, to be ner to be uh, wary in these in, in these uh, minimum airspeed, minimum entry speed maneuvers that are very high angle or high deck angle maneuvers uh, that the airplane could get stuck in this nose pointed up attitude like we did. And that if your plan is to recover with a hammerhead, it's very, very important to be at or very near zero G's when you do that to avoid the, the risk of an inverted snap, which we encountered. Because there was such a big envelope expansion for the airplane, we were uh, going fast, we were pulling a lot of G, and then we ended up going to negative five, point, negative 0.5 Gs. Uh, the flight was ended with a very thorough aircraft inspection, uh, looking for things like uh, smoked rivets, cracks in the paint, indications that the structure had permanently deformed or that there may be uh, buried structure damage underneath the wing skins. Uh, all that went well. There was We didn't find any damage to the airplane. The, probably the most interesting thing was that since the uh, you know the nose came up, and then that hammerhead uh, was not only uh, just a, a hammerhead or a negative snap, but because it was negative, all the oil in the bottom of the crankcase is forced up to the top of the crankcase, out the breather. So just at that moment, you can see it in the tapes. Just as that moment, as the nose is coming over, the breather is puking all that oil overboard. So you actually, the whole left wing was totally covered in oil, and so far forward as the front of the left wheel pant was actually covered with oil uh, from that maneuver, which was uh, interesting. The Thorpe uh, is a relatively small airplane to have a parachute and a helmet on in, but they both fit. I didn't uh, hit my head on the canopy or anything like that. You know, fit my knees underneath the panel, uh, even though the, the chute was pushing me forward, uh, which says a lot about the design of the Thorpe, which I think we've covered in previous videos. It's a very impressive design. I really uh, feel fortunate to not only have flown a Thorpe to the corners, but also this Thorpe, Lou Sunderland's Thorpe to the corners. Um, but then it's also a credit to Dennis and his rebuild of the airplane, since he did so much work in the cockpit, incorporating those Cessna 162 Skycatcher seats, which are a fantastic addition, I think, to this airplane, but probably in general. If you find yourself in a junkyard and come across a set of Cessna 162 seats, I would, I would suggest you purchase them for your next uh, home build, because it's a fantastic little seat uh, that really worked well in the Thorpe, but I would es estimate it probably worked well in other home builds as well.